Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming um, today on our lecture series for um, here at OSU Medical Center. Now, I am Andy Patchett. I am a nephrology fellow. This is our last year here at OSU Medical Center. I did do my internal medicine residency here also. Um, my medical school was done in Arizona, and I'm originally from Las Vegas. So, um, it, we, uh, my family and I moved here, and we quite enjoy it here in Oklahoma. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about an issue in the, the I've had several questions, um, not only me, but also my attendings, um, about the etiology, um, but also the treatment, and just the diagnosis of um, renal arterial stenosis, which is common and it is seen amongst um, our population of patients, especially if you're in the internal medicine world. Um, but this kind of over, goes over many different uh, realms of uh, medicine, um, including primary care, surgery, um, interventional cardiology, and nephrology with uh, associated interventional radiology. So kind of uh, go through a case that we had recently, um, and then kind of just a brief overview of some of the causes of renal vascular disease, and then we'll kind of go into more of a treatment, uh, what are the indications, and what how do we treat um, renal ar artery stenosis? So back in, I think, July of last year, so it was my first um, ro rotation in nephrology. In, at St. Francis, we had a 73-year-old female who was known to our clinic, um, had been seeing us in an outpatient setting. Um, she was admitted to the hospital for complaints of intractable nausea and vomiting for about two weeks. Um, she didn't have any abdominal pain. Um, she went to her primary care doctor. They gave her some Finergan, didn't provide any relief. So she went to the hospital. The CT of her abdomen um, didn't show any acute intra-abdominal findings that could really explain her nausea and her vomiting. Um, but there was seen that she had a right atrophic kidney. Now, this was not something that was new. We knew that she had a right atrophic kidney. Um, but she did come in with a, she was short of breath, and she had edema. Um, and then she also had signs of acute kidney injury. Her past medical history was significant for insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes mellitus. She had uh, coronary artery disease and had a history of a bypass. Um, PKD stage 4 with her baseline creatinine about 2.2, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and then um, sick sinus syndrome with a pacemaker study. So on physical examination of this patient, um, with her complaints of her nausea and her vomiting, um, an abdominal exam was sought after, and she had a non-tender abdomen. She had bowel sounds. Um, she was having bowel movements at home. It was noted, though, that she had a blood pressure of 190 over 89. Now, this was not uncommon for her. She had hypertension that was uncontrolled uh, with several medications. Um, she had one plus edema, and, and then she also did um, exhibit signs, like I said, of some uh, pulmonary edema with some decreased breath sounds, and she was using her accessory muscles uh, for breathing. One other interesting thing on her examination was her left first toe was dusty and cold, which kind of clued into, well, did she have like an atheroembolic phenomenon going on um, that could be happening with this? Did she just have severe vascular disease? Um, so her laboratory values, the numbers I have on here are really the only thing that's abnormal. So remember her baseline creatinine is 2.2. Her creatinine upon presentation was 2.75. Now, this is acute kidney injury according to the standards of 0.3 above her baseline. Her BUN was 35, so was her nausea and vomiting associated with possibility of uremia? It's possible, um, but it's urea nitrogen was not that elevated. Her CBC, her hemoglobin was low, 9.5, attributable to the fact that she had anemia of chronic disease and secondary to her chronic kidney disease. Her UA was pretty bland, did show a little bit of protein, did not have any blood, and her specific gravity was 
1.011. So acute kidney injury on CT86-4, very volume overloaded. Chest x-ray showed pulmonary vascular congestion with cephalization. Um, did talk to her a little bit more about the fact of how was her urine output at home. Did she have experience any decrease in urine output? And she said no. Um, she felt that she was urinating just fine. So we started her on aggressive diuretic therapy um, to try to move some of this fluid. The next day or two, um, kidney function really kind of stayed the same. Her nausea and vomiting persisted but got a little bit better. She still had that dusty toe. However, her blood pressure was started to get controlled in the hospital about the range of 130s to 150s. Now, like I showed, the initial blood pressure when she came in was in the 190s and dropped her, you know, the blood pressure dropped significantly uh, relative to her hypertension. So she had noticed we had an increase in her renal function over the next couple of days. We were concerned the fact of too aggressively diuresing her. Um, and then we obtained a um, renal ultrasound to see what was going on. Of course, right kidney was unable to be seen due to the fact that it was atrophic. Left kidney was kind of normal in size, 11 by 5 by 5. So she didn't have any anatomical signs that could tell us why um, she had this acute kidney injury. No obstruction was noted, no hydronephrosis. Um, or anything like that, no signs of infection. Um, so we continued to diurese her, and she actually did diurese quite a bit, and she was urinating throughout this whole hospitalization. It was decided that we were to get a renal arteriogram to kind of a Doppler to kind of see what was going on. The left renal artery um, <clears throat> measured velocity shows about an approximate um, stenosis of greater than 60% on the left side. The right side shows complete occlusion. There was no blood flow at all to the right kidney. Now, two years prior to all this, we had done a renal artery arteriogram and she did have blood flow to the right kidney. So she had progressive atherosclerotic disease um, going to the right kidney also now, obviously going to the left kidney. This patient is a patient that is seen um, commonly um, amongst those that do have atherosclerotic disease, you know, coronary artery disease. She had peripheral vascular disease with her um, left toe that was ischemic in nature, and now she shows signs of renal um, ischemia due to atherosclerosis. We were concerned about the fact that does she have an atheroembolite like I talked about before. Um, urine eosinophils were negative. Um, did not show any other signs or exhibit other signs of uh, atheroembolic disease. But she did not have any recent imaging, any, any recent manipulation of the aorta or anything like that that could have caused an embolic phenomenon. Did not have any emboli um, or any thrombi noticed um, in her heart at all when she did do an echocardiogram. Unfortunately, this patient did not recover her renal function, and she was subsequently had to be started on um, dialysis. Now the question that was posed to us from cardiologists and also the hospitalist with this patient was, do we do a um, renal angioplasty of the artery and do we stent this patient because of her um, presenting these complaints? So renal arterial disease, most patients with stenosis in the renal artery show they show laboratory evidence of chronic kidney disease. Um, this is all due to the fact of decreased renal perfusion, and that's pretty much it. Now, this is not an all-conclusive uh, all uh, list of causes of renal artery stenosis, but the ones that you'll commonly see are atheroembolic disease, fibromuscular dysplasia, and atherosclerotic renal artery disease. Now, atherosclerotic renal artery disease is most likely a unilater unilateral disease on presentation. Whereas fibromuscular dys dysplasia and atheroembolic disease can very much so be a bilateral disease. Another name for atherosclerotic 
possibly more artery disease is ischemic nephropathy. Um, this occurs mainly in people greater than 50 years old, very commonly in those that have associated coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease. Like I said before, it can be unilateral or a bilateral disease. Um, so this lady, you know, she had known as chronic kidney disease, but it was a gradually progressive disease and wasn't acute in nature. So atherosclerosis of the renal artery is a slowly progressive decline of the kidney function. Um, it usually does not happen acutely. This will, you know, you, you can see effects of the GFR um, at about 40% of stenosis of the renal artery. But it, does, it, it actually is not until about 80% of stenosis of a renal artery that you start seeing ischemic changes with fibrosis within the kidney, and you actually start seeing um, the effects, the chronic kidney disease effects of the disease. Here's a chart, a graph here, that does go over. So here's the line. This is a stenosis on the bottom, and then blood flow, and then also reduction in perfusion pressure. So these patients at 82% of blood flow um, is not affected until the stenosis is about 82%. And then perfusion pressure is not affected until it's about 80%. So it's pretty significant amount of stenosis that these patients have to have before you start seeing a, you know, a decline in their renal function and their urine output. So clinical manifestations of these patients, they can have what, you know, what's termed a renal vascular hypertension. These patients tend to have a higher nocturnal blood pressure. Um, their nocturnal blood pressure is elevated due to the fact that you actually have decreased um, blood flow. Um, your GFR does increase when you lay down to go to bed at night. And so because of that increased blood flow and because of that increased volume that's going to the kidney, the blood pressure is going will go up. They have signs of left ventricular hypertrophy, which is due to just the fact of the afterload pressure that these patients have um, because of the amount of fluid they have in their body. And like this lady, they very, very commonly have resistant hypertension. Um, Workup of CKD, bland urine, serologic and immunologic workup for chronic kidney disease is negative. Um, renal ultrasound usually shows small sized kidneys. Now, in this lady's renal ultrasound, one kidney looked normal, the other one was atrophic. If you have a renal ultrasound and there's a two centimeter discrepancy between the kidney sizes, then you really need a clue on the fact the smaller one may have artery stenosis of the, you know, right there in the renal artery. Um, renal artery Dopplers, so the criteria to say that you have about 60% stenosis is you have to have the uh, systolic velocity above 180. Usually about 200 is kind of the number that <coughs> the radiologist and that we use to define a 60% stenosis. Now again though, a 60% stenosis does not mean necessarily that their um, renal function is um, declined to the fact of you know, possibility of needing dialysis, or, but it does clue you in on the fact that they need aggressive therapy to try to inhibit the progression of this disease, because just like coronary artery disease, you know, um, the treatment is going to be, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is pretty much the same. So what can happen, the clinical syndromes that happen um, with these patients? So renal vascular hypertension. This happens because of the RAS activation. So renin, of course, gets activated because of decreased perfusion of the kidney. Increase in renin will uh, try to dilate the uh, afferent arteriola, which it cannot do, and it constricts the, eth the efferent to try to increase pressure. Well, that increased pressure, um, 
obviously you can use a blood pressure. And so that's all, that's what happens with the renal vascular hypertension. These patients can also develop acute kidney injury. Um, and this can be secondary to the fact of ACE or ARB therapy initiation. Now the, we'll talk a little bit later, but the treatment for atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis is ACE therapy or ARB therapy. Now why do we use it if it can cause acute kidney injury? Well, it's because of the activation of the RAS system that we use for the renal vascular hypertension. The problem with using the ACE or ARB therapy, though, is it can lower the blood pressure to a point that perfusion pressure decreases so much that you have a decrease in your GFR. So another thing that can happen is you have an elderly patient that has unexplained chronic kidney disease. You've done the whole workup, nothing's come back positive. And that's just really what happened in this lady. Uh, we couldn't really figure, we, we knew what was going on, that what she had, but didn't really know the the length or the amount of stenosis that she had in that residual kidney that was trying to work. So with the unexplained chronic kidney disease and her, you know, doing the Dopplers really helped us clue us in on what was going on. Now what also happens is these patients is they can get a problem called flash pulmonary edema. And this is kind of what almost happened to her. Um, she came in for other complaints, but she did have pulmonary edema. The reason these patients have this um, increased edema in their lungs is due to the fact of they have the impaired pressure naturesis. So usually if you have too much volume on board, your kidneys in response to that um, from the heart and from the brain will get hormones, the natriuretic peptides are one of them, um, that can help naturesis. Okay, it activates in response in the kidneys and it goes to the collecting duct where you remove a bunch of fluid. Um, flash pulmonary edema is one of the problems um, with renal vascular, um, with uh, atherosclerotic disease in the kidneys that you can um, try to treat, but it's very difficult to treat for them. So here's some diagrams of what's going on. So unilateral and bilateral renal artery stenosis. On the unilateral side, you have that um, kidney on the left side that has the stenosis. Activation of the RAS system, which increases renin, which you know basically comes down to the point where you have hypertension. What happens is the contralateral kidney will hypertrophy and um, you actually have increased renal perfusion at that right side. The right side obviously will have an in, will have a suppressed RAS system, and then also what happens on the right side of the kidney, since it's still all intact, the ability of it to secrete the fluid and the sodium will help in the hypertension. These patients. Usually, these patients do better than patients that have bilateral renal artery disease or patients that have a history of just a solitary kidney. Because what happens with that is you can see over here on this the far right side is you have an impaired sodium and water excretion. You can't get rid of it. And so what happens is you get a volume expansion. So you have volume expansion in the RAS pathway that's being activated and then you get this terrible hypertension. Well, this is what happens with patients that have the flash pulmonary edema. They don't have the ability to get rid of the water. And so that volume expansion will suddenly cause uh, the patient to have an inability of the heart to contract to be able to get rid of that fluid. And where does the water go if it doesn't go forward? It goes backwards and it goes into the lungs. So they have the increase in arterial pressure and um, hypertension that's very, very difficult to control. So over the last 30 years, the discussion of medical therapy versus um, invasive therapy has been questioned. 
and medical therapy versus renal artery angioplasty with or without stent has been questioned um, since about the early 1990s, late 1980s. Early 1990s, there was a study done which uh, has gotten a lot of criticism um, and was not really looked at as being um, a, as a good study because after that study was done, it, what it basically showed is that with angioplasty and with stenting, patients have a better outcome. They have better ways of treating with hypertension. Um, and so between 1996 and 2000, there was a huge and dramatic rise in patients who got renal angiograms done. Subsequently, they had the stent in place and the angioplasty. Um, since that study, though, there have been several studies come out um, about this because people started seeing that it really was not having the effects that the study initially had said it would. The most recent study that I could find was in January of 2014 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, there was a study called by the CORAL group, which stands for Cardiovascular Outcomes of Renal Atherosclerotic Lesions. It's a multi-centered, open-labeled, randomized, controlled trial. Um, it compared medical therapy alone with medical therapy plus stenting in patients with known atherosclerotic renal arteriosclerosis. These patients had to have CKD, and they, they, most, they obviously had um, elevated blood pressure. The reason that they did this study is because they said that there wasn't anything that really showed the clinical outcomes of patients that had stenting done versus medical therapy alone. So their primary endpoint was major cardiovascular or renal events. Renal event could be acute kidney injury, initiation of dialysis, cardiovascular outcomes are, of course, MI, um, or hospitalization for congestive heart failure. Their results down here in that lower bulletin showed that renal artery stenting did not have a significant benefit with, with respect to prevention of clinical events when added on top of medical therapy. So, and this is aggressive medical therapy that these patients went through. Um, with this patient that we talked about at the beginning of this lecture, but with other patients that we've had same question, um, do, you know, can, can we do a stint in these patients and will that help their hypertension? Will that slow down the progression to end-stage renal disease and prevent them from dialysis or dialysis failure? And according to this study and four or five other studies before this one, it has no effect. Now, I get questions still um, from um, physicians, um, residents about this um, treatment. Um, and sometimes, you know, it used to be very, very common when cardiologists would do heart catheterization. They would do what's called a drive-by and just drive by the renal artery and squirt a little dye in there to see what's going on. Um, at, right, that has been out of favor and it is no longer indicated because obviously stenting provides no added benefit to this aggressive medical therapy. Here's a graph showing the results. Um, this is event-free survival over here. So basically the red line and the blue line. So the blue line is the stent plus the medical therapy and then the red line is the medical therapy alone. There is no statistically significant um, outcome for stenting the patients versus just keeping the renal artery. Um, these patients have very similar declines in their renal function and very similar hospitalizations um, for events with MI uh, and also um, flash pulmonary edema, which they could be attributed to the fact of congestive heart failure. So the treatment for um, atherosclerotic renal 
faster than you is um, initiation of a RAS blockade. You know, ACE or ARP therapy. You may see a rise um, if you have a patient that has renal artery disease, stenosis, and you start them on an ACE inhibitor. You may very well see a rise in their creatinine. And that is all due to the result of the fact that you are controlling their blood pressure and they now have a decreased perfusion of their kidney. Now, does that mean that their kidney function will continue to rise? No, it won't. And it may actually get, it may actually come back down. But in the event of having the patient controlled with their blood pressure with the ACE inhibitor or ARB, um, you're actually helping their hypertension and the other effects of hypertension like a flying stroke. The other thing you really need to do with these patients is cardiovascular risk reduction. So aspirin, statin, baby aspirin, um, statin smoking sensation of diabetes control. Um, one thing you also have to do is, you know, in patients that have unilater unilateral disease, they still have a well-functioning kidney. So preventing <coughs> any kind of acute kidney injury to the good kidney is very, very Make sure that they're not taking those NSAIDs for their back pain or they're not taking those NSAIDs for, you know, because they helped move some furniture over the weekend and they, you know, popped several ibuprofen. Um, you got to really watch the fact of them getting uh, dye studies and um, imaging studies. Anything that can cause acute kidney injury, you don't want to worsen their renal function if they just have one solitary kidney that's functioning um, now, Dr. Calabrese, on this lady, he actually, you know, she's in dialysis, but to prevent her from having any recurrent episodes of flash pulmonary edema, which this has been in favor um, amongst some nephrologists, there's no studies on it or anything like that as of yet, but she did have a, she was evaluated for a stent. But her stenosis was so tight that she was unable to get a stent. But some patients um, have received stenting of their renal arteries because of uncontrollable flash pulmonary edema that these patients be admitted to the hospital several times because of the fact that they were intubated um, two or three times a year because of their pulmonary edema. Now these patients, albeit were optimized on aggressive medical therapy, they had the treatments that were necessary for them to um, usually have good morbidity um, from their disease. So atherosclerotic renal vascular disease is in a spectrum of cardiovascular disease. And it is seen in patients that have unknown or unknown causes of their chronic kidney pain. And it's important that we do look at these patients, especially those that are greater than 50 years old, those of the elderly. You know, we have several patients that have coronary artery disease and per, uh, peripheral vascular disease. And this does play a role. Um, sometimes it is difficult to say is there a chronic kidney disease due to just the renal artery stenosis. And if they have diabetes on top of that, and if they're spilling a bunch of protein in their urine, they probably have a combination of both. But again, use your treatments of uh, ACE inhibitors and ARB, aggressive other medications for blood pressure control, and you know help them with the limiting the factor of uh, aspirin, statin, um, smoking cessation of glycemic control for their uh, cardiovascular risk factor. Now. Does anybody have any questions? Questions? Okay. So stenting, no. We don't stent anymore. Um, everybody, I mean, you'll get the question. You will. Uh, so aggressive medical therapy, no stenting. Okay. 